I want you to take a shower when it's minus 30 outside, and I want you to open all the windows in your apartment, and I want you to get out of the ice cold shower and go lie in the middle of your hardwood floor naked and try and stay warm while you cry. That's what it's like to be me every fucking day. <laughs> You know what's good about being in recovery? If you're good at it, you stop really giving a shit what other people think about you. I'd become keen enough at my skills where people would ask me for help. When someone's leaving post-acute care and they want to be reintegrated back into their lives, a sobriety coach can make that a lot easier. This guy just got out of treatment. He wants you to stay with him for a few days. And I got asked to do that on a couple of occasions. And then my wife, she said, like, this is what you do. This is your gift. You're, you have a gift. I love you. What? I love you too, Bob. Are you okay, though? This is a disease that is not a moral failing. And if we can start looking at it like that. I saw a video. The whole world's gonna see it. I don't have a problem with that, but it is extremely embarrassing. Yes, I have some more crack cocaine. Do I? Am I an addict? No. Can you get off my property, please? Don't can don't get off my property! I got a call in early June to say, would you be interested in working Rob Ford? And I said, yeah, shit yeah, absolutely. I went to Greenstone, a treatment center north of Toronto. Was he sober when you got there? He wasn't in great shape. Did he drink a lot when he did drink? Do you know, like, what, what is An that? Olympic level, big. He told me flat out you could drink a Mickey like it was a shot. He couldn't have been any less interested in having a sobriety coach as I was to having root canal, uh, <laughs> you know? We went at it pretty hard. He called me a, a you know, Frenchie. You're just a Frenchie Quebecer. You weigh a buck 50, you know, whatever. I used to call him a fat fuck, uh, you know, a Mr. Mayor. I told him, buddy, if you think you're going to leave here, then it's going to be easy, especially being you. And uh, I think I shook him up enough that he said, okay, maybe this is a good idea. It was like he just said, I'll do whatever it takes. Like a bull in a china shop. Absolutely, let's go. And he had interviews lined up. Oh, well, he's coming out of treatment. He's going to have to speak. Shame on you! You're a disgrace! What do you say to those who say you should have stayed in rehab? No respect to the fact that the addiction is a disease. No respect for the fact that he was in early recovery. He's got to answer these questions. He's the mayor. He's embarrassed us all. He's a man in his addiction. I have begun the process of taking control of my life. I've never seen someone come out of treatment and been yelled at and treated that way. And he did it, and he did it well. Don't shove me. The guy that says I kicked him, who's a professional shit disturber. I never touched him. Never, never touched this guy. And then the policeman's telling me, I, I saw you do it. I, Great. There's the gang that couldn't shoot straight. So I just walked away. And I thought that that was day six. I was like, well, I'm done. They're not going to keep me. And he just said, they're going to gin it up really good. And you're going to be the media in 24 hours. not going to know who you are. Stay here. Who said that? Mr. Ford. He said, does anyone die? He said, no. He said, quit acting like that. He said, buddy, we're good. And that was the end of that. After working with Mayor Ford, the phone rang with a different type of client. People would say, well, Jesus, he worked for Ford. Uh, <laughs> first things first, I'm getting from your clinical team, as well as my guy that's boots on the ground with you, is the same thing. You're doing the work, finally, you're doing the work. My drug of choice was Oxy, you know, Percocets, uh, painkillers, fentanyl, heroin a little bit, but uh, it goes like this very, very quickly. You were in a situation that's unlike pretty well anyone I've done. You know, you were a multi-millionaire at 21 years of age. And you did not know how to handle that money. No shit. What I was doing was just so fucking disgusting. <clears throat> Last Christmas, with a few eyes only, uh, we took 12 girls back here 
There was probably nine different types of narcotics up here at that time. And noon the next day when the party was still going, I got a call from concierge. There's like six hookers running around here all down on each other. I had a motorbike here. Two of them were diking out on here and um, they're like, yeah, we got an email from the CEO of RBC saying, shut your fucking blinds. No one's getting any work done, exactly. The productivity on the west side sucks. It was awesome, it was fun, you, know, you can't deny that. That's why people drink and do drugs, to have fun. Once they start taking over other parts of your life, your school, you know, your relationships, it gets to a point where you literally can't manage it. And Bob was the guy that I knew would flip it for me, you know? Well, he can't flip it, you, I have to be the one to flip, but he's the best guide out there that I would have had. Him and Dave on the ground are, Awesome. No. No. Hey! This is Larry. Fucking Larry. You wanna say hi? And as you can see, Charlie, he has some sort of Asperger's syndrome. Both rescues. They're my family. Because of my recovery, I don't have as big an aversion to um, responsibility. I had a completely happy childhood. A big loving family and everyone was around and people, oh yeah, there had to be something going on, you know. No, turns out I was raised by a proper gentleman and a lady and uh, I'm really lucky for that. Yeah. I've got ADD. Not that there's ever been any hard scientific data gathered, but I'm pretty sure there's a correlation between a love of cocaine and being ADHD, positive of it. What's your addiction resume? You want me to talk about this? My mom was not gonna join me talking about this. My first drunk was at 13. At 15 is when I did my first line of coke. That love affair started then. It was, little did I know that it would do what it did to me. Fast forward 10 years later, I'm incapable of staying in school one job after another. You know, people are going to work and I'm like, oh, they're all schnooks. I openly admit to people, like, they're doing the wrong. I was really good at writing bad checks. <laughs> you know, the, the amount of money in the end, it didn't matter what I made, it was going. My nose, I have one nostril. Been operated on three times. The amount you need to use to do that to your nose is spectacular. A guy that I had met had showed me how to inject cocaine. He's dead now. I, there wasn't anything I wasn't taking in the end. At that point, heroin had come into the picture. I went to rehab and the first day, I was the first couple of days I was in rehab, I was like, a travel agent had made some fucking error in my life. <laughs> what am I doing here? And I went to bed and there was that sound of the fucking, it's like a piss pad they put over the bed, that crinkling sound. And I remember thinking, holy fuck. And I woke up and said that next day and uh, I knew then, I knew then. I said, okay, I'm gonna be the best person I can be in here. Because I had, I could compete. I could always compete. And I said, I, I, I'm worth more than this. It's a, you know, you'll hear people say that. It's a disease of more. Yep. Give me more. I haven't had a drink or a drug since January 2nd, 2004. And I was like, okay, you've, you've got to give it back, which I knew. Um, and then I was with the girl again after that. Hence my contentment today. Now that you've been honest with her, there's no more anxiety. No, that's very true. Uh, whenever we've gotten you into trouble, it's always been the same thing. Oh uh, shit, Bob, I'm so uncomfortable that uh, I don't want them to know I don't drink. But now when you tell them, nobody said, my yeah. God, what's wrong with you? That's a sponsor you call. Should I simulate a car crash? Mm -hmm. What's up, son? Daddy-o. You all ready? So uh, we having a drink or what? <laughs> Bob brings a bunch of guys here that are good eaters and <laughs> then bang through the San Pellegrino uh, water inventory. Uh, I've been doing this for 25 years. I lost cooks have worked for me that have hung themselves and shot themselves in the head. I can count six. Okay. I knew Bob was doing what he did, but then we didn't. We just had an, like, an issue at the be this year where we all of a sudden Within four weeks, we had like two people that were like, we're getting ready to watch these people die yeah. at the end of the day. And that's where like fucking Bob, I'm qualified to, I have 70 employees, I'm qualified to deal with all kinds of situations. My education and coping with it is 
firing them, beating them up, okay, or telling them they're garbage, okay? And all of a sudden, I had someone saying, listen, man, there's another way to do it. And then Bob handled both of them. It was amazing. And both dudes, I love these dudes to death, and they're both doing super well. How do you qualify to be a sober coach? That's a good question. Um, Because there's no real formal training for it. I'm certainly not, and I never will pretend to be um, a clinician. We're at Chatsworth Pavilion. I like to tell people, you know, would you rather your chicken grain-fed or factory farmed? And this is the grain-fed of treatment. So let's go in and say hi to Richard. Alcoholics and addicts contribute incredibly to mankind. From Mozart to my sweet, sweet, sweet Willa Nelson. So it is not up to us to determine whether or not you should be clean and sober. But if you want to be clean and sober, we have a system for you. Is there a place for recovery coaches? Yes. The problem with recovery coaches these days that we have in North America, it's a pioneering field, right? And too often we see people that are in recovery that feel that because they've been good sponsors in fellowship, they have the talent to be a recovery coach. Where the gray lines start appearing is when you start diagnosing because you want to turn to the recovery coach and say, do you have a medical degree? Really? Well, no, but I've been in recovery and I know. Are you Really? This is it? This is your credentials? You've been in recovery and you know? Okay, fantastic. Just like Uber, you know? It's like one day I'm a taxi driver and one day I just decide, hey, you know what? I'm a recovery coach. Do you know what a pilot's training is for? It's not to fly the plane on a beautiful, sunny, warm day. It's to fly it when engine number two is on fire and you're losing hydraulics. When the shit hits the fan, not a lot of people want to be there. I have a job to do, a dangerous job at times. If I do it properly, I get some to, to help someone. Always on your phone, sir. Yes, Always sir. on your phone. How are you? See you? <laughs> Always a I pleasure. can help you with that. Yeah? Technology addiction you got yeah. going there? Bottom for addicts is death, you know, and that's too late. I mean, I like to look at addicts kind of, you know, they're always treading water. They always think everything's going to be okay. They're pushing away the help. I'm okay. I'm deflect, all right. Deflect, 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 deflect. deflect. If I had this, if I just had a better job, if I just had a better girlfriend, whatever it is. And a lot of people won't ask for help until they actually go underwater. And you know what? The, the sad part is people die. I, I you know, I'm not going to name any of them, but I, I we, th- both that's, we both that have dead part people. sucks. Yep. In 2004, when I got sober, when I started into my path to recovery, I would go to meetings and some old timers would tell me to shut up. Shut up, junkie. Shut up, addict. Oh, don't bring that up here. Alcohol's a drug. I'm sorry, there's some drugs in my story. I used to think, what the hell's going on? That's happening so much less now. We do it a little differently. It is called SOS, which is sharing our sobriety. A lot of guys that are some oddballs and they stick out a little bit, but they found a home and we're at. The first topic, do you consider a bird or a snake a pet? And the other topic is one of my damn favorites, which is why are you here? How y'all feeling? I'm good. You're good? Well, there's the one person I don't care about how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I'll make you go first. Why are you here? I came here because I was dying. It's that simple. I heard in one of these meetings you have to go from recovery to discovery. And that's what keeps me coming back because I'm discovering all the time new ways to deal with what's wrong with me. Your other subject about cats and uh, birds. Birds and snakes. Snakes? Birds and snakes. Cats cats or snakes? No, they're not pets to me. Dog's a pet. Good answer. Every single program in the world is based on the steps of AA. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can just change the word, you know. 
you know, booze for coke or, or narcotics or anything, you know, it's good for everybody. Because in 10 years, there ain't gonna be anybody that's just a drinker. Everybody's co-addicted. Hi, Sarah. These meetings are my medicine mm -hmm. for my disease, which is addiction. Um, if I don't come to these rooms regularly, I will go back into my old mind frame. I will go back into my old behaviors. I come here and I'm greeted with a bunch of people who love me unconditionally just for being me, and I need that feeling of connection in my life. Sobriety is the most important thing. Nobody tells you that there are rules and there are things you can't say. Why they decided to put anonymous in the word alcoholic recovery, I, I sometimes wonder. Anybody that wants to talk to me about recovery, I've got no problem with it. I find it's so important to talk about recovery because as, you know, as a 24-year-old female, I had no idea that people were getting sober this young. I had no idea. And whenever an old-timer came up to me and said, man, are you lucky to have gotten it so young? To me, that translated as, fuck you, you got 10, 20 more years than I did <laughs> drinking. You got, to, you got yeah. to stay out there. <laughs> Try and live up to that during your share there, fuck face. Fuck you. <laughs> okay, <good. laughs> Stop me when this sounds too familiar. You know, we're all looking for some variety of salvation. So we've looked to a path that has a central text and a belief system that has developed around that sacred text. <laughs> Sound familiar yet? You know? And it, it's sort of like, at first it was like, what the fuck is, you know? Um, but now it's just kind of like, you know, it's like, oh, it's one of those meetings. <laughs> I wonder what I can just sort of slip in under the radar that's gonna make people go like, did he just say that? Did he say that? He's not supposed to say that. Did he mention he's an addict? And I was like, um, okay. Alcohol is a drug which makes all of us drug addicts, and there is no God. Thanks. <laughs> people told me to stay away from this meeting at the beginning. People say the prick who leads the meeting picks people, he makes you share. I was told, yeah, I was told to stay away from you on more than one occasion. I want to say I loved AA. I, I am so angry and so drifting away from what I hear in AA. Zero passion, zero hope, zero thought. And I know I, I, my anger and my low self-esteem, but I'll be fucking goddamned if anyone's gonna say I don't bring honesty and passion. How do you really right. feel there? And birds. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, sorry, I have to. I have birds and I hate them. I have, I hate every one of them. If it was up to me, I'd give them their freedom in the dead of winter. <laughs> I remember the first time I came home with a bottle of vodka and you knew there was no turning back. My life was going to be a mess. I know this sounds corny and, and I put my life into two categories. There's before Bob and there's after Bob. There's no doubt. There's no doubt that, that this man took me as a, 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 a shell of a person, looking like a homeless man, not having, not knowing how to live, not knowing how to dress. I made him go through a red light just so he could live a little. Can you feel that? You know? I, uh. I, I, I shared in a meeting once that Bob inspired me to pull a U-turn on St. Denis, and I had an old timer pull me aside and say, you know what, Larry, that's not a good sponsor if he's telling you to break the law. I have no idea what you're talking about. He made me feel alive for once in my life. You have views that don't necessarily go along with what other people say. I think when you open your mouth and you say so confidently, God didn't do it for me, I did. I love when you say that, but there are a whole group of people who just can't take that. Bob. Bob. <clears throat> Can you tell me anything about how much you charge for this type of work? No. Is it lucrative? It's a good business. There's, I, I can't do that to the client. Yeah. Absolutely not. No fucking way. It really does depend on the level of the client and the needs of the client. Yeah. Uh.
this is where I live. This was the road to my recovery started here. You know, getting sober, one thing, staying sober, bigger thing. Look at that, door's open. <gasps> Mother. Let's act like this is natural. Hi, Mom. Hi. Come on in, boys. He rarely missed a Sunday dinner, which was interesting. And very often we got the worst Bobby on the Sunday because it was usually after was a long weekend over. of partying and the odd time, you know, there'd be white substance on his nose. And, and I uh, never, honest to God, is that true? Of Jesus. course it's true. I of never, true. ever noticed it. Yeah. Honest. Wow. Uh, I think a lot of it, we often call my mom the queen of the Nile because I don't think she wanted to see certain things about Bobby. I thought he smoked pot and no big deal. Yeah. yeah. Which was actually the one thing I wasn't doing. His, his main priority was getting high or getting yeah. whatever. Yeah. And nothing else mattered. I think my father probably knew more than we did about what was going on. Visits from bailiffs. I'd say, what? Ten bailiffs? God, I'd say more than that. Ten, twelve, I don't know. It was, oh yeah, boys. I got that I knew them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I came down on them hard, knowing what I was like, because you know, there was so much going on. I probably told you that if it, you kept on, mom and dad would die and it would be your fault. Nice. Right around those lines, it was fucking hammer time. It got to a point where if I heard a siren in the middle of the night, and if we heard that there was a murder, there was anything, we'd think, yeah. It's Bob. And I That's remember right. saying to my mom, the only way we'll get through this is to accept now that he is probably going to die. And it made it easier for us to live. We said, let's just expect the worst so when it does and happen. And you're right, we did think that. And we said, he, he'll, he, let's accept, he's, he's going to die. Yeah. yeah. Was not as quick to forgive Bob as... <laughs> it took my 10 years. When he took his 10-year chip and I heard other people, complete strangers yeah. to me, saying how he had helped them and how he had saved their life and, and yeah i thought okay 10 years is long enough i don't resent him for it it's an illness and it's not his fault that i reacted the way i did now we have new bob he's still a pain in the ass but a different uh <laughs> in a different way yeah. in a different way <laughs> it says sorry mom when I called Bob, I hadn't talked to my family for a month or so, and, and uh, you know, they basically just said goodbye. They had held their bottom lines and said, we'll see you at your funeral. Your mom yeah. and dad both told you those, those words. Yeah. My mom basically said she's picking out her black dress, and that's the last I spoke to her. So I was looking like, you know, these guys are enemies watching, hovering over. The conflict, yeah, it's like, fuck, not to sound like a prick, but it's like you're a fucking 24-year-old millionaire and you're letting this guy fucking tell you what to do, you know? And it's like, what are you, what are you thinking? What's wrong with you? But then I kind of snapped out of it and said, this is what you need to do. I've never met an athlete like, that likes her coach until they win. And I think it's very important that you remember that all he wants to do is win and win back somebody's life. See you later, fuck nuts. <laughs> You want my Ferrari to go to the airport? Yeah. I think I said this, I'd sooner drink Drano than drink. It would be quicker. And the people that love me wouldn't have to go down that path. I'd beat the crap out of everyone that loved me, so I don't want to do that again. There's no point in being sober if you're not being remarkable. Fucking mediocrity sucks. I lived that way for years. Don't want to live that way anymore. Am I rolling right now? Yeah. Fuckers!